for grace and for wisdom and for understanding. We pray that you, our hearts would be challenged by the teachings of the Lord Jesus as He sought to help His disciples to have a deeper, stronger faith. And we realize that this is something that we need to. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, well, let's take a look at uh, Matthew. Let's turn to the book of Matthew. Right, we are at chapter 17. <clears throat> okay, and, and this morning's topic, it's, it's a challenging one. It is, really, no question about it. And it is recorded here. Again, we read how the Lord Jesus spoke on the subject of death. And we read in uh, chapter 17, <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 17, right? Let's take a look at it. And in verse 22, Matthew 17, okay. Now, while they were uh, staying in Galilee, so they spent some time there, right? So the, the bit of a context, you know, they, they, they were up in the mountains, three of them they came down, and then there was a big hoo-ha going on, now, what was happening? There was a, a boy that was very, very sick. The disciples tried to help, of no help. And then this man came to the Lord Jesus, please help my son. And to find out this poor boy was uh, possessed by a very powerful demon that has tormented him all his life. And so the Lord Jesus, uh, you know, had to, use this as a time to teach the people about faith and also to restore this uh, uh, boy to help him, right? And uh, lessons that the disciples needed to learn was their faith must be one that is strong because he tells them, look at verse 20, you know, because of your unbelief, you see, because of your unbelief, you were not able to help this boy. Because of your unbelief, you were not able to resist the power of evil. And this is something that we all need to confront. And the Lord had to, to tell them, uh, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you know what? You could have done so much more. They have not taken the time to develop this faith. If only you have faith as a mustard seed. See, this is the problem. So a lot of the time, we feel we have faith. That's, we feel that faith is there. Faith is not a feeling. You either, it's either there when it counts or it's not. And for the disciples' situation, not. More not than yes. Remember, they felt that they would even say, who is great? Who is the greater one? So they were very convinced that they had faith. After all, they've left all. They followed Jesus. They learned many wonderful lessons from the Lord, about the Lord. And then they had positive experiences in ministry to success. Right? They were able to heal. They were able to cast out demons in the Lord's name. Really good. But then, how come? They felt so helpless. And so the Lord kept on telling them, this faith of yours, you lack that faith. You know why you lack that faith? You lack that understanding. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, and he tells them, you could move mountains, right? Nothing will be impossible for you. Verse 20, nothing. If only we have faith. He tells us that if only you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could overcome a lot of obstacles. You could say to the mountain, it was impossible. They could not 
go beyond us. Did they have genuine faith? Yes. That, yes, they do. Did they sincerely, genuinely believe in Jesus? Yes. Even Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, the Lord says. Blessed. Good. But that faith has not gone beyond a certain level. That is the problem. Has our faith gone beyond professing Jesus is Christ, Jesus is Lord, we believe in Him? That was where the disciples was at. So you must see the context. So we you, you begin to realize why the Lord had to, to help them. Now, right? And then after this part, he, verse 22 is what we are reading today. And then Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of man. Okay, now in the next statement, is what really troubled them. And he tells them, and they will kill him. Right? And then he finishes with, and the third day he will be raised up again. He's not going to remain dead. He will be raised up again. How did they respond? And we read, and they were exceedingly sorrowful, all of them. Now, this was challenging. Okay. Can they have a faith to, as it were, understand and face death? Now, that is the subject that the Lord was bringing up to teach. And it is a hard subject. Now, look at this. Is it hard to teach this? Yes. What is the hardest subject that a pastor must teach? Death. This is where funeral ministry is always hardest. It literally is, after the whole week of funeral ministry, you are really exhausted. Not because of the physical logistic, because you, it is a hard thing to have to teach. It is hard to teach. It is hard to understand. And most of all, it is hard to accept. Right? So, you, is it easy? No, don't, don't let anyone tell you that, oh, this is very easy. Just accept it. It's not easy. Did the disciples accept the death of Jesus? No. They were, ex how do you know? Exceedingly sorrowful. Now, that was something that the Lord had to... Now, who taught this? And the, none other than the Lord Jesus Himself. Right? There is a contrast. The faith of the Lord Jesus and the faith of disciples is startling. And He would teach them about the subject of death in His own life. He is going to face it now. Well, we read this is what the Lord... Now, is this the first time the Lord Jesus taught about death? No. All right, you go back to chapter 16, you see the Lord Jesus uh, teach this and tell the, chapter 16, verse 21. Remember, just not too long ago, Jesus began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things, right? And then be killed and be raised. Same, same topic. And then, there, right, we remember Peter reacted. He took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. And saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. you. It cannot happen to you. Out of love for the Lord Jesus. Of course, he loved the Lord. It cannot happen to the one I love. And the Lord had to rebuke him. And says, one, Satan's involvement had to be identified. Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense. And then Peter 
you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. See, this is the problem. Not mindful of the things of God, but the things of the flesh, self. Right? So, the, the, the Lord had to correct this. Chapter 16. Now, He brings it up again. This time around, He didn't say anything. <laughs> Notice, right? First time, wow! And then He, he, he got corrected. And okay, yeah, this time around. He didn't say anything. He knew this is not right to say that, but it doesn't stop His heart from being sad. He and the rest. Remember, Matthew was there. Matthew described how they all felt at that time, exceedingly sorrowful. Right? So this is something that is not easy. Not easy to teach, not easy to understand, not certainly not easy to accept. Right? Did the disciples struggle with this word? Yes. Right. It's hard. Why? Even hard? Well, because of a few things. Right? If we take a look at the context of it all, first and foremost, the Lord Jesus is only 30 something years old, isn't it? And he was in his prime. The prime of life, the prime of ministry, he was on the rise, not on the downhill. He was popular, people drew near him to hear him, he could help so many people. Nobody could come near his kind of, right? Disciples tried to help this man and the son, couldn't. Only one person could help, Jesus. It's very hard to accept this person is going to die and to die soon. Remember, the Lord says he is about to ha- is about to. Ha- He's not talking about the distant future. He's not talking about 40 years from now. It's about to happen. And the Lord Jesus is bringing up his own death. He will be betrayed, he will be killed, and he will die, and he will be raised up. And the disciples was exceedingly sorrowful, cannot understand, cannot accept. The Lord was in his prime. Two, how is it possible? He is so powerful. Somebody like that cannot, he just cast out a very powerful demon as in just. And he is going to be killed by mere mortals. Oh, how to accept? Right? How to accept? You must see, oh, the disciples will accept. Why? You ask why? Well, there are lots of reasons why. On the one hand, cast out powerful demon. On the other hand, he will be betrayed by men and killed by these mere mortals. Powerful demon can't even one word and the demon run. Men kill him. How does that work out? Cannot. Very hard to understand. And of course, the third reason is obvious. It's very personal. This is their, this is their teacher. This is, you know, they have so much more to learn from Jesus. They do not feel ready. They know they're not ready. You just told us, if only we have faith of a mustard seed. They don't have a... You cannot leave now. If we have great faith, you leave. Okay, but not now. You can't leave us now. There's so much more to learn from you, Lord. There is so much more to experience from you, so much more to see from you. Not now. What do we do? Who do we learn from? Who's going to help us? Who's going to correct us? There was none like Jesus in their life. None like Him. And so it is difficult. Obviously. And Matthew just used two words, exceedingly sorrowful. I think we can understand that. 
Right? Is it wrong to be exceedingly sorrowful? No. Is it wrong to be sad and is it sinful? No. But disciples, you must go beyond this. Right? Now, we're going to take a look at other texts because there are three other gospel writers that put this together and then compare the text and to see what the Lord Jesus was doing for them, with them, right? For example, in Mark, now, this is also recorded in Mark and Luke. We have Matthew's account in Matthew 17, right? So this is a good way to try and get the feel for the whole thing is to put it all together, read the other texts in the gospel, and you put it side by side, right? Now, how do you go beyond feeling exceedingly sorrowful? And the Lord had to help them. Otherwise, you're stuck. You're just stuck in sorrow and you cannot get out easily. So the Lord had to help them. Now, first, Mark 9, verse 30, verse 32. He, we read, it's the same account here, but certain things are highlighted that we may see it perhaps a little bit more clearly. Right? In verse 30 of Mark 9, we read, uh, they departed from there and passed through Galilee and he did not want anyone to know it. Now, verse 41, because his focus is not on the multitude here. Because if other people know, guess what? They'll bring all their sick, all the demon possessed. Lord, you know, please help, please help. Please. There will be no ends. There will always be people to heal there will always be ministry to attend to. The Lord had something important He needed to attend to, and this is what Mark is capturing. Don't let anyone know, and then He taught, verse 31, He taught His disciples, and the key word here is taught. So He wasn't just merely making a passing comment that He is, uh, that death he is going to die. He's teaching them. This is the subject for today that we need to learn from, we need to learn about. I'm not talking about death theoretically, conceptually. Let's personalize it. I'm talking about my death. That is obviously challenging for them. And he taught his disciples and said to them, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of man, and they will kill him, and after he kill him, he is killed, right? He will rise on the third day. And then we read, they did not understand this saying, but were afraid to ask him. Now that is also the problem, Right? Of course, we see in Matthew, they were exceedingly sorrowful. Now, what, what, what else is it? Did they understand what Jesus is trying to say to them? No. Not do they not understand that He's going to die. That's, that's not the point. He cannot, they cannot understand why He needs to die. And why now? But they were too afraid to ask Him. That becomes a problem. When you cannot understand and you're too afraid to ask, you're stuck. All right, now that, the Lord had to do this. He, a hard topic like this, it is hard, but it had to be taught. And the Lord Himself is not afraid to teach it. He's not afraid to face both suffering and death. Why must it be taught? Because the disciples need a much stronger faith for themselves. He cannot, Jesus cannot have a strong faith for them. They need a strong faith for themselves. The Lord can do many things for us, and He can. He can give us His grace. He can empower us. But He cannot have a strong faith for us. We need a strong faith for ourselves. The Lord must teach. They must seek 
to learn. But what, what's stopping them? Fear. They don't ask because they're too afraid to ask. Right now, that becomes a bigger problem, right? The Lord needs them. They need a stronger faith for themselves because one day they will face this too. They will, of course, face the eventual of the Lord Jesus dying. It's going to happen. Whether you say, I cannot accept, I cannot accept, it's going to happen. You might, you, the best thing is to be able to have a faith that is strong and courageous and understanding. Now, we take a look at Luke's uh, account here. This was Mark. Now, look at Luke. Luke highlighted another problem, right? We read in verse 43 in, in Luke 9, and they were all amazed at the majesty of God. Well, can you imagine the Lord Jesus just cast out the demon and they were all busking and wow, how triumphant. On the one hand, the Lord overthrow uh, a powerful demon. But while everyone marveled at all the things which Jesus did, He said to His disciples, verse 44, Let these words sink in into your ears. Saying, right, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of man. Right? And then, of course, the rest follows, that he will be killed and rise up. It's the same account. They did not understand this saying as it was hidden from them, so they did not perceive it. Again, we read they were too afraid. They were afraid to ask him about this say. What's the problem? Right? Again, that fear, afraid. They did not understand. Right? Here's another problem. Let these words sink into your ears. I think we all have this problem. We don't want to listen to such words. Don't talk to about death. Don't talk about suffering. Don't talk about it. Change topic. The Lord is not changing topic. Let these words sink into your ears. I want to see the glory of the Lord. We want to see the power of the Lord. As everybody was marveling. There are things we want to hear. There are things we want to see. Because it... Wow, what an uplift to our heart and our faith. We, these are the things we want to see. And the Lord says to them, let these words sink into your ears. Right? I mean, this is also, we don't, we don't want to hear. We don't want to listen. We see, the Lord wants to teach, but there's certain things we don't want to hear. We don't want to hear such words about death. So nobody likes to come for funerals, go for funerals. Nobody likes to go for funerals. Who does? Because it's going to be sobering words. It's going to be about death. Nobody wants to hear such words. Right? You tell people, oh, well, okay, I, how, what, this week, how's it going to be your week? Oh, this week I went to a funeral. Before you even say anything, they will tell you, oh, I'm sorry for you. It's good, terrible. And all, but, you know, all the negative, because nobody wants to do this. It's very human. And the disciples were there too. And so the Lord tells them. He knows what the problem is. Why they are not understanding this. Why that faith hasn't grown it's not even the size of a mustard seed yet because certain things, they just don't want to listen. Even when the Lord Jesus explained it to them, He had to, to rebuke Peter. He had to tell Peter, Peter, you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. Okay, he just keeps quiet now. He's still troubled. He's still sad. But he also learned, 
better not speak this time around. He, last time he spoke, he got rebuked. But what changed? Nothing. They don't want to hear. They don't want to listen to these words. They don't want to listen to such words. And so the Lord had to teach because you cannot avoid this subject. The, long, the more you avoid it, the less prepared you will be for it. And you need to be prepared for it. When is it going to happen? That's what Jesus said. It's about to happen. Are you ready? Oh, we are very sad. We are afraid. We are upset. We are this. We are that. Yeah, you can do all those things. By the end of the day, how are you, how, how you coping? They are not coping well. That hit them really, really hard. Right? So we look at Matthew, we look at Mark, we look at Luke, and you put it all together. How do you, how do you deal with these problems? I think only we know, we see ourselves here. True, isn't it? One, we don't understand, but we are too afraid to ask the Lord. Ask Him. Two, we don't perceive it. We don't understand it. Not only fear, we don't, want to, we don't want to hear these words. And yet the Lord tells His disciples, let these words sink into your ears. They would rather not think about death. They would rather not think about the Lord's death in particular. See, we can distract ourselves. Matthew 16, he spoke about it. He had to correct them. He had to teach them. But while they were all busy you know, serving, you know, doing this, doing that, it's forgotten. Those words are gone. It's certainly not sunk into their ears. They've not sought the wisdom of God to understand. That's why it's still hidden from them. The, the, right? The, this is what Luke says, right? Uh, it was hidden from them, so they did not perceive it. When something is hidden from you, it must prompt you to find out, to search it out. Seek for it. The Lord has already taught them, seek and you shall find. Ask and it will be given to you. Knock and it will be opened to you. This is like the earliest lesson. Where is the seeking? Would you not seek the strength, the courage, the wisdom of God to understand? Why not? I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear. That's your problem. You can't run away forever. And they did, by the way. In fear, they just left. They fled. And the Lord had to search them out and to restore them. They still had to face it. At this time round, they learned. They let those words sink deep into their ears, into their heart. They began to seek a stronger, greater faith than what they presently had. And it begins there. It really, really does, okay? So when we take a look at this, we compare the text. We, this was what the Lord had to teach them. It was taught. He taught His disciples. And He tells them, let these words sink into your ears. Right? The problem of no perception, no understanding was something that they have not dealt with. They could seek it but they were too afraid to ask him about this further. Right? That is the challenge of it all. Okay, so we look at the, what are the vital lessons that we must learn for ourselves. And you know, it, you know, it ends there, so we must uh, think about it further. Matthew just ends there. Mark just ends there. The, the answers are not revealed in the next statement. But when we must ask, what lessons are we learning from this as we read the Scriptures here? You want to go on being exceedingly sorrowful? Time, they say, time will heal the broken heart. 
That's not true. I wish it was. I remember what Auntie Kev told me. And she said, when my son, when my husband died, it felt as if a part of my heart was torn away. That was very, very hard. How long ago was that? 50 years. What? 50 years. Are you still grieving? Yes. How do you cope? And she tells me her favorite text. Off by heart, because by then she cannot see, she cannot hear. I say, every time I feel that way, that sorrow comes, I remember the Lord's word to me. That He will be a husband to me. That He will be there for me. That I need not to fear. That He will be there to strengthen me. That He will be there to uphold me. Many verses in the Scriptures. Another verse, with you for underneath are His everlasting arms. This is Deuteronomy. I begin to realize she was one who just, how did she cope with these pain, the sorrow? And the word is cope, not cure. Right? This is not a complete removal. You cope. It is hard. That's why I never tell people, just get over it. Because it's not easy. Just move on. Move on to what? Move on to where? It's hard. And it's humbling. That's like I say, the funeral ministry is one of the most difficult ministry. I don't, that's, I, I don't eat, get other people to chair. I don't get other people. I, it's, it's because it's so sensitive. It's so challenging. It's so delicate. You don't have all the answers. And you know you can't even take away the sorrow. You cannot even be strong in your faith for the person who is sad. The Lord Jesus couldn't. He could not take away the sorrow that they felt. He could not say, I'm going to be strong for you. I am going to have that strong faith for you. They needed to find this for themselves. He who has the power to cast out a powerful demon. That's why it is so challenging. When this text is put side by side, could he not help the disciples? Could he not just give them the strength? Could he not just give them the courage? Could he not just give them the faith? I'm pretty sure he could. God, you know, he has the power to do anything, everything. And yet, the disciples had to find this for themselves. It's the same for all of us. Right? Cannot. I wish to give you this faith. Can't. I wish to be strong for you. Was Jesus praying for his disciples? Yes. All the time. But they still must have a strong faith for themselves. This is the same for us. The Lord can pray for us. He can intercede for us. He could be there to comfort and strengthen, but we still need a faith that is strong for ourselves. This is a vital lesson that first I must learn. Right? That would happen. I, I believe with all my heart, God sent Andy Kath my way to help me to understand many of these things because I didn't, as a younger person, perhaps. And she really shared with me the sorrows that she felt. Not everybody would do that. Most prefer not to. But she shared with me the deepest, darkest pain that she actually felt. That was our closeness of our relationship that we had. And we would pray and we would seek the Lord for a faith that would be stronger than the present one we had 
at the moment. Her husband and then her son. He says the son, the death of her son was even more painful because this is your son. To bury a son is the parent's great pain. And she said, how did I cope? I asked, how do you cope? Again, she goes back to the Lord, go back to his word, go back to who he is, go back to her faith. And she asks for a stronger, deeper faith to cope. These are the vital lessons we learn. We can learn them from others, or we can learn them from our own personal experience too. And then, this is what is needed. Fear will hinder. Can we, rather to be too afraid to ask, can we ask? All the, all the gospel writers said the same thing. They were afraid. And they didn't understand, but they were too afraid to ask him. They were afraid to ask him. Would we ask? Would we ask for understanding? Would we ask for grace? Would we ask for wisdom? Would we ask for courage? They were too afraid. That's something that we need to do. That this, it takes faith to ask. That's why James says, if anyone lacks wisdom, in that case, this is about wisdom, let him ask of God. But let him ask in faith without doubting. For he who doubts, like the wave tossed through and fro, this person is a double-minded person, unstable in all his ways. That's what James taught, and that's true. They were unstable. They must ask, but ask in faith. Now, two, right? The, the growth of a stronger and mature faith is obvious. See, the Lord's Word do they really believe in the Lord's word? Jesus did not end with death. He ended all of it with saying, the third day he will be raised up again. Can they see beyond death? And at that point, they couldn't. Right? Of course, that relationship will be different. The Lord, yes, He will be raised, but He will go back to heaven. He's not going to be remain on earth. They will miss Him. They will wish He was there. They will, all the moments that they had together is very hard to see it change. They don't want it to change. But it will change. But they must look beyond the present. They must look deep down. They must look back at all that the Lord Jesus taught them and seek to teach them. He will always be with them. He will never depart from them. He has never departed from them. These are the lessons. Let these words sink deep into your ears. Go back to His Word. Go back to what He has said. Let it sink deep down. Did it happen? Yes. Matthew recorded what Jesus said. Then these words now are there. It's not death. It doesn't end there. He will, on the third day, He will be raised up. That is the hope of the resurrection. The resurrection of Christ, but the, re the, the, the resurrection of believers too. See, that is what gives us. How do we cope? Faith, we've mentioned that already, isn't it? How do we cope? So I asked Kath, how did you cope? My faith in God, I cope. My hope in God, I cope. That's where I draw my comfort from each day. In the words that Jesus said. 
I will rise again. And if I rise, you will rise. Two things. My faith, my hope. If I don't have these two things, it is like falling into a black hole and you can't get out. This is my faith. In who God is, in who the Lord is, in what He has said, in what He has done, I hold on. Right? And you don't fall, but don't just hold on with one hand. The other side, my hope in God, in what He has promised for the future, I hold on. And I will not sink in despair. Well, this was important for me to learn from Auntie Kath because it prepared me for her death. The friendship of 10 years have left a very strong mark in my heart. And I realized I couldn't let her go. I could teach. I can understand. I couldn't accept. I still remember when I was called up by the doctor and they told me that, um, you know, she's, this is called perhaps going to be her last night. She's not going to make it through. So I remember going driving down to Mandra with Eldine. Now that's where she was. It doesn't matter where she was, I will drive there. It doesn't matter how late, I will drive there. And then saw her and, you know, I just wanted to be with her. And the doctor spoke to the doctor. The doctor said, ah, no, she's not going to make it. And then I know my following week was hard because I was going to go to, over to uh, Malaysia side for family camp, ministry there. And I knew that if I, I, you know, once I go, I come back, she's going to pass on. And it was very difficult. And I still remember that evening when I was just, it was just hard. It was very, very hard. I shared with her all the things that I wanted to share with her right? when she was 90 years old. 90 years old. Uh, having coffee at, you know, I would go there to help her with the hearing aid and all that. In the usual little corner, that coffee table, she asked me, uh, Chris, I need you to prepare for my funeral. I'm like, First, nobody has asked me to prepare for their funeral when they are alive. That was... It was a very, like, what happened? Are you, are you sick? Are you dying? What's going on? So, no, 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 no. You just, just prepare because, look, I'm 90. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> Anytime, okay. Right? So she gave me a list of hymns. That was a very long list. <laughs> this is all the hymns that I would like to, you can pick. There's <laughs> a list. And she hand wrote all the things there. And then these are my favorite Bible texts. She basically handed over her thing and she said, I would like you. Would you be there to could do the funeral for me? I said, I would be by order. But it was very, it, wasn't, it was interesting because it was initial sadness, but then it turned out to be a very happy, you know, she's talking about going home to be with the Lord. It was, it was a very special thing. It, this did never suck it. So when did she eventually pass? At 103. <laughs> that takes 10 years. You know, after a while, you sort of like, maybe she'll never. It won't happen. It won't happen. It won't happen. But when, you know, when she was 90 something, the doctor, that night, I, it hit me so hard. I couldn't let go. Honestly, I could let go. It was really painful. I understood her words now better. I can't let go. And yet, as a pastor, I struggled both ways. One, as a pastor. Two, as a friend. As a pastor, you must go to be with the Lord. As one who is a friend, it was, I was torn between two inside. I still remember I said, Kath, I, I want to share with you all the things I want to say to you because I'm going for ministry. I'm going away and I know I won't be able to see you. So I said to her all the things I wanted to say to her. 
side. I sang for her with, of course, with, uh, you know, it didn't even, probably didn't even sound right because you just, tears were just, couldn't stop. Just sang. I wanted to sing, I wanted to share, you, you know, I've been preparing this for 10 years. And then the person who comforted me was her. And she said, Chris, you know, you know, I, you know I'm going to be with the Lord. You know, I, you know she just, you know, words of comfort, words of, you know, we thanked each other for being friends for each other. And we talked about how the Lord has brought us. So many personal, precious thoughts, memories. And then the hardest part was to get up and, and to leave. And I knew I wouldn't see her again. So when I came back, I called the family and, and the doctor called, and they said, uh, you know, please come. She's, is she is still, still alive? Yeah. You know, inside. Anything? Nothing. Nobody called the whole week. What's going on? And then come back. I went to Mandra to see her. She is sitting up eating jelly. I said, what? What's going on? You haven't eaten for a month now? You're eating jelly? And she looked at me. I was so happy. You know, I was in tears of joy. And she had tears of... She asked me, what am I doing here? Why am I still here? Why did the Lord not take me home? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what, how to answer such a question. But you know what? She lived on for the last five years, but every, every time became something that I just treasured. The word is acceptance. It was the hardest thing to do. But when that came, I found that strength and peace to be able to cope with her death. This is what I couldn't, have, couldn't, couldn't come to terms to. Did I understand it in my mind, in theology? In, in, I've done many funerals. Yes, but this is personal. The acceptance part was hard. It was very hard. But when I found that acceptance, when I was called to the hospital this time, she had a serious fall. And then the grandson had a very dis difficult decision to make. The doctor said, operation or let her go. We don't. She'll die within the next few, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, or give it a shot. This is a grandson that loved her, and she loved this grandson. And I, both of us were there, both of us holding her hand. And I said to the grandson, this is what your grandmother wants. Let her go. Let her go home to be with the Lord. As I say it to him, I say it to myself. I say it to myself. And she passed on that afternoon. I, of course, I was the one who did her funeral, and many of you were there. But those have become powerful lessons ingrained inside me that I needed to learn. Many reasons. Now, as I look at this text now, the Lord prepared His disciples. Don't ignore it. Don't avoid it. Let it sink deep into your ears. Don't be too afraid to ask, to face it, and learn. And when you learn, you will have a faith, not only that will save yourself, but other people who hear you. This is a lesson for all of us who are disciples of the Lord Jesus too. Okay, well, I'm going to give you this time to ask questions. You can ask whatever question you want to ask from anyone. Anyone want to raise that? Okay, go ahead, Lino. Yeah. I know this is a challenging, hard topic and personal, and hence I wanted to teach it in the most personal way I can, not, not theoretical, just examining the text. We begin with the text, but uh, you, know, you feel the sorrow of the disciples when it is personal. 
All right, uh, go ahead, Lionel. Yeah. My question yeah. is, yeah. Um, were the disciples um, sorrowful because one of them would betray the Lord? or uh, Not at this point. Oh, okay. Yeah. First, they don't know who is going to betray the Lord. They, in their wildest imagination, they didn't think it was among them. They didn't think. They always thought it was somebody outside. Maybe one, you know, some, the scribes or Pharisees has planted a mole somewhere. Maybe they, they didn't think about that. The sorrow was just directed at who Jesus is and who he is to them. That was it. The main, you know, the sorrowful part was, it is their master. He's spoken about death before. He's even, even um, been there for Lazarus. And Lazarus, right, uh, was loved by the Lord, and he loved their, him. And the two sisters were really distraught and sorrowful. The disciples were there, you know. Were they just as sorrowful? No. Not that they had no feelings, but it's different. It's very different. They were sad because of the occasion. Yeah, this is a fellow brethren who's passed on. It was a family that was very sad, exceedingly sorrowful. But this one, had, it hit hard because it had to do with Jesus. This was their master. This was their shepherd. This was their spiritual father. They, they, everything to them would die with him. And they, it was hard. They loved him. They cared for him. He, you know, yes, they had to rebuke him, but they, you know, they, he, they know the Lord loves them and he, they, would, they would be there to, to learn. And the sorrow part was not because of the betrayal. It was because of death. It was hard to hear those words. Okay, right. Uh, any other, does that, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, right. Any, any other question that you want to raise up on, 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 on this subject over here? Right. Hard because we, yeah, like, like the disciples, we also don't like to hear such words. <laughs> not, not a word, not a way to begin the Sunday morning. Ooh, such words. But let's be reminded of the Lord Jesus. Let these words sing. Okay, uh, Josh, are you? Okay, that's what it is. <laughs> um, Pastor Chris, yes. um, I have a question. Yeah. So since yeah. I've been serving as an AVA ministry, right. how could I um, apply faith in this type of ministry? And okay. Could, um, All right. okay, so this is not about death, right? No, not about okay. death. No, <laughs> All right. about death. How can I apply faith in the AVA ministry? Good. This question is about service. Mm. Well, Josh, you want the short answer or the long answer? The Do long answer the will take you two months, which is the whole series of messages. Mm. This month, starting uh, this morning, okay. today, yeah. it will be about servanthood. Mm. That is a wonderful word to study over here. Right? So Christmas, what is it about? Yeah, it's all those wonderful things. Plus, servanthood. Mm -hmm. Right? That would be the long, you know, slowly, slowly, slowly learn kind, <laughs> and I hope you will and okay. enjoy. But how can I apply? See, it begins with our understanding of who the Lord is, who, you know, about life. How do I want to live my life? Here, the Lord Jesus, mm. as a servant of the Lord, right? And to Him, once his work is done, he's going to be back with the Father. Apply that in life. AVA is one part, okay? This is only, unless you're a professional AVA person, this is only one day in the week, and not all the time, isn't it? Yeah. So you do not want to just pigeonhole this and say, okay, I, how do I serve AVA? See your whole life as a life of service. That is a very special way of looking at life. It really is. That's, by the way, how Jesus looked at his life. He saw his whole life as a life of service to God. 
in many of the uh, uh, prophecies. In, in Psalm 40, you prepare the body for me. What is this body for? The book it is written of me. It is for the Lord. It is for His service. And a lot of people do not see life as a service privilege to be called servants of God, that I can utilize this life to serve God each and every day. And I don't mean at church, because you're not at church every day. But in all that we do in life. Right? Church is special because, you know, it's a body of Christ. We have a part in it that we can play a role. It is our honor. It is our privilege. How do I want to fulfill this role? With great joy, with great privilege, with great honor. Right? When I read the book of Leviticus, and especially Leviticus, it hit me hard that in the past, the role of servanthood only belonged to a special group of people called the Levites. You can't, even if you wanted to. But this is now open to all children of God. What an honor and privilege. And yet, many don't even see it as a privilege or honor. Worse, they see it as a chore. Right? Bring back the honor of this title, servants of God. Well, this is this Christmas. We look at the Lord Jesus as the one who, who brought so much honor and, and everything else to this title, servant of God. Right? So that's the short answer. <laughs> Okay, cool. Okay. <laughs> but you know, apply really, as you get to the what do I want to do in my life? You know what? I want to utilize this in every way possible. The messages that we have heard, right? Remember uh, what the Lord Jesus was teaching his disciples? Okay, just a quick one before we close. Go back to Matthew 24. If you want to apply this, then take a look at this uh, word over here in Matthew 25. Remember? This, let these words sing also into our ears. In Matthew 25, here was the commendation of the Lord, and He said it to the person who had five talents and the person who had two. It doesn't matter whether you have five or two. That's not the point. The point is this, right? Verse 23, His Lord said to him, First, in anything, okay, whether you're AVA or anything, can the Lord say to you, well done? You have done it well. If you haven't done it well, cannot say well done. <laughs> right? If you, you know, you did a poor job, well done. You are... He didn't say well done to the other guy that did really obviously did do well. He was lazy. He didn't do anything. Right? He tried to make excuses. Just do it well. Well done. That's one. Good. <laughs> That's the next part. How do I want to see it? Do it well. Do a good job. Why? Because you are good. Good. There is goodness in the way you do it. There's the goodness. You know, that you see, this is how God does, and you do it out of a good heart. You do it out of a good spirit. Well done. Good, in particular, this goodness is, you know, highlighted. There are many, you know, aspects of goodness that could be there. And the Lord highlighted one aspect of goodness that stands out. Faithful. Well done, good and faithful servant. That is how I would apply it. You didn't do it just once. That's not called faithful. You do it and you keep on doing it until whenever the Lord comes home, um, comes back. You're faithful. You're consistent. You do it and you do it faithfully. You do it because that is the goodness. 
you have utilized all that the Lord provide for you. It's His resources He gave you. The talent came from the Lord, not from them. He gave him resources, gave them. And they utilized this. Good. You've utilized all that the Lord has blessed you, right? Josh, thank God you are blessed with some AVA skill. Not everybody. What do I do with it? I want to do it well. Well done. Do it well. Well. Right? Some are blessed with music. Some is blessed with cooking. Some is blessed in teaching. Some is blessed with giving. Some is blessed with translating. Not everybody can do everything, obviously. I can't certainly do everything. Right? Some got a wonderful hospitality part inside them. They make people feel so welcome. They are, they, are, they are greeters, right? Thank God for every... You would you recognize this. We're all given different resources in our life. But I want to do a good job. Well done. Do it well. You want to do it? Do it well. I, I don't want to make excuses, Lord, why I didn't do well. Because you didn't give me enough. You didn't... You, know, you went too long. You did this. You did that. So the Lord comes back and rebuke. Why well, you are lazy? You are not mindful. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's that was you know, we ended there. Matthew twenty five. Apply it. Apply it. All right. We're going to learn further that the Lord Jesus will show us what it means to be a good and faithful servant. Indeed. Okay. While we pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the Lord's example and we pray that we would learn from the Lord Jesus and to be challenged further to apply all that we learn into our life. And we pray that you would guide and help us, grant us your grace to be able to, on the one hand, cope with the challenges of life with a greater faith and on the other hand, utilize all that you have blessed us with in our faith to live for you to be that servant of yours, to serve you faithfully and true. We ask that you would bless our day of worship and our fellowship together. Bless all who are serving you today. Strengthen them too. May they be good. May they do their work well. And may they be faithful servants. We ask that you would bless in Jesus' name. Amen.